Hello and welcome to another YouTube tutorial. My name is James Piper, I'm a Senior Fellow and a Lecturer in Acute Medicine at the Royal Free Hospital in London. Today I'm going to talk about chronic coronary syndromes or more commonly known as angina. And as always you're welcome to contact me if you have any questions about this presentation. Today I'm going to talk about the assessment of angina, the diagnosis of angina and its management. Most commonly, patients will present to a clinician with a sensation of a constricting discomfort or pain, particularly at the front of their chest. Typically, angina may also uh, radiate commonly, for example, to the left arm, jaw and neck. However, in atypical presentations, uh, patients can describe a GI discomfort, shortness of breath and nausea. This can, of course, be related to the pain and it's important to um, be aware of someone's cardiac risk factors if they seem to be presenting with atypical symptoms. Obviously, it's important um, and they can be difficult to distinguish between something like GORD, uh, biliary colic and angina. Angina is a very common presentation. It affects 8% of men and 3% of women in the UK between ages 55 and 64. And overall, there are 2 million people in the UK who have a diagnosis of chronic coronary syndrome. The aims of treatment of chronic coronary syndromes are, of course, to reduce the symptoms, improve the quality of life and long term morbidity, to, i.e. to try and prevent someone having an acute coronary syndrome and having a myocardial infarction. The pathophysiology of angina, uh, where the myocardial ischemia will result in the development of localised acidosis, which then gives a sensation of pain. There is some evidence that the primary mediator of angina is via adenosine, um, which in turn works via the stimulation of the A1 adenosine receptor pathway. It's important also to note that angina is referred to the corresponding dermatomes C5 to C6 and T1 to T6, and that supplies the afferent nerves to the same segments of the spinal cord of the heart. And again, this knowledge is important in appreciating the pathophysiology of pain and the, how it corresponds to a patient's description of their pain. So there are two types of conditions which will uh, exacerbate ischemic pain. The first one, of course, is increased oxygen demand on the heart. And these basically fall into non-cardiac and cardiac categories. So, for example, in a patient who is hyperthermic, hyperthyroid, with sympothymometric toxicity, um, at being activated, such as with the use of cocaine, hypertension. So all of the things that will drive someone's heart harder, therefore increasing the oxygen demand. Specific cardiac pathologies, which will again will increase oxygen demand, including hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is simply due to the increasing muscle mass and therefore the oxygen demand at a cellular level. Aortic stenosis, putting strain on the heart, dilated cardiomyopathy, and of course, tachycardia is both ventricular and supraventricular. On the other hand, you may have a decreased oxygen supply, and again, this will fall into non-cardiac and cardiac, non-cardiac being the biggest group. So decreased oxygen supply to the myocardium will, of course, be things like anemic conditions, hypoxia from respiratory conditions such as pneumonia, asthma, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, sickle cell disease, and other conditions um, such as uh, leukemia, thrombocytosis, and so on. Again, uh, conditions, cardiac conditions will cause decreased oxygen supply, include aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. For students in the United Kingdom, it's important to make reference to NICE uh, guidance, and it's important also to recognise angina that diagnosis is usually clinical, therefore it's important that you may take a meticulous and detailed history to make sure you are clear about what it is you are dealing with and the likely risk um, to the patient of having a co acute coronary syndrome. So typical angina presents with all three of the following features. Precipitated by physical exertion, constricting discomfort in the front of the chest, in the neck, shoulders, jaw or arms. It's important to note that they don't have to have discomfort in all of those places, although patients will typically describe pain in front of their chest, which may then radiate upwards to the neck, jaw or arms. Typical angina also is relieved by rest or GTN spray within about five minutes. Again, a typical angina which presents two of the above features, so i.e. Uh, pain on exertion, discomfort that radiates in a classic pattern, or relieve with GTN, and atypical symptoms such as gastrointestinal discomfort and or breathlessness and or nausea. 
There are certain features which will make a clinical diagnosis of angina more likely and less likely. Features which will make a diagnosis of angina more likely will include uh, increasing patient's age, the male sex, cardiovascular risk factors and established history of coronary artery disease. I will just say with the male sex that it is important that you, um, although uh, angina is more common in men, it's important that you do not discriminate on the basis that the patient is a woman and therefore disclude uh, angina as a diagnosis if there are other factors which make it likely. Fe clinical features which make a diagnosis of angina less likely include pain that is continuous or prolonged, pain that is unrelated to activity, pain that is brought on by breathing, and pain that is associated with dizziness, palpitations, tingling, or dysphagia. So it's important also to be aware, as well as the characteristics of angina, what the characteristics are of major non-cardiac causes of pain, and they are displayed on this slide here. I won't go through them all, but just for example, gastroesophageal reflux will often have a duration of pain of about five to 60 minutes. Patients often describe it as a visceral sort of inside burning, substernal pain. Worse, if they lie flat, there's often no radiation and often it's relieved with food and antacids. Esophageal spasm, for example, is similar and but associated with cold liquids, um, but you'll note also that it is uh, relief with nitroglycerin. Peptic ulcer and biliary disease, again, often have a visceral burning epigastric focused pain and may occur either with food um, or um, be relieved by food. Often they'll have normal ECGs. Again, musculoskeletal pain will often form part of the differential diagnosis in assessing if a patient has chronic coronary syndrome. The musculoskeletal pain, again, tends to have a variable pattern of pain. It tends to be superficial, positional, worse with movement and have a localised tenderness. It's important to have an approximate um, idea about how significant the patient's symptoms are if you think they have a chronic coronary syndrome. So, for example, I've given you here the Canadian Cardiovascular Society grading angina pectoris, similar to other NYHA gradings, class one angina, is only uh, present during strenuous or prolonged physical activity. And class four is an inability to perform any activity without angina or angina at rest, i.e. severe limitation. So going back to the diagnosis of angina, again, remind you it is mostly clinical. And hopefully these extra slides that I've given you will be helpful in determining whether uh, chronic coronary syndrome is likely. The next stage is to consider a functional imaging. So this basically is to assess the dynamic hemodynamic consequences of coronary artery disease. And the two most common mechanisms that are used are myocardial perfusion scan or MPS and stress echocardiography. Other diagnostic options in assessing chronic coronary disease include again, as well as MPS and DSE, uh, include um, angiography. Previously, we used to use exercise tolerance testing, although these are now rarely used for angina as these have been superseded uh, by better technologies such as myocardial perfusion scan and dibutamine stress echo. I've put a link up here to a very good review article on functional imaging in cardiac disease. and I've used some of the figures in that article uh, for this presentation. Now, when we go on to uh, look at the sensitivity and specificity of SPECT imaging for the detection of chronic coronary artery disease using the different stresses, you can see from this slide why exercise testing has fallen out of favour. So, for example, if we use exercise as a, um, uh, a, a stressor, you'll find that sensitivity is reasonable, about 87 percent, comparable to the other modalities. However, its specificity falls to 73 percent. Whereas if, for example, we do a dibutamine stress echo, sensitivity is 85 percent and specificity is 79 percent. However, the most superior one is to use adenosine as a stressor, which gives a sensitivity of 90 percent and a specificity of the best of 85 percent. So what information does functional imaging such as dibutamine stress echo um, imaging provide? So as a reminder, it's to assess the hemodynamic consequences of coronary artery disease. And basically, stress on the heart will induce a regional perfusion defect or a regional wall motion abnormalities. And these are known in the code as uh, WRMA. The induction of stress on the myocardium causes an ischemic cascade, which I'll show you on the next slide. 
So, for example, you can see here, and again, this just to reiterate why uh, nuclear imaging uh, and MRI and stress echo are far superior to uh, using exercise testing. So, for example, stress via treadmill or pharmacologically induced, such as dibutamine, will increase the heart rate and, in turn, increase the myocardial oxygen demand. Vasodilators, which are used in stress echoes, such as, for example, adenosine. Um, again, it's important to note that um, adenosine here is used in much smaller amounts than the treatment for SVT and dipyridamol as well. It's also important to note that complications using agents such as dibutamine and adenosine are very rare. On this slide here, I've given you an example of a reversible defect on a nuclear uh, medicine scan, or otherwise known as a myocardial perfusion scan. Both panels A and B show short axis slices of the heart following stress and at rest respectively. You'll notice that where the right arrows are at present is a reversible defect in the anterior and anterolateral regions, illustrating stress-inducible ischemia. A fixed perfusion defect most likely representing scar tissue is present in the posterolateral lateral and inferior region. You may have also heard of a technique known as C2 calcium scoring, and this is basically the quantification of calcium in the coronary arteries. It is a marker of atherosclerosis, and the absence of calcium on a CT uh, scan basically virtually excludes atherosclerosis. It's also important to know there's an association that there is a very low rate of cardiac events in patients without calcium on CT. A study by Raghi et al. Um, demonstrated um, in about 4,800 patients without diabetes and no coronary calcium that the five-year survival was 99.4%. The presence, however, of coronary calcium only indicates atherosclerosis in general, and of course may need additional evaluations such as via angiography. So which patients need angiography? So there are two um, groups where angiography should be considered. First, where angina that significantly interferes with a patient's lifestyle despite maximal tolerable medical therapy. And the second group is patients with clinical characteristics and results of non-invasive testing that indicate a high likelihood of severe ischemic heart disease. So, for example, imaging or strongly positive treadmill tests suggesting a large amount of viable myocardial, uh, myocardium at risk. So treatment for angina, first line is beta blockade. Uh, beta blockers reduce anginal symptoms by decreasing both the heart rate and contractility. Also, they reduce the heart rate blood pressure product during exercise, the onset of angina or the ischemic threshold during exercise is either delayed or avoided altogether. All types of beta blockers appear to be equally effective in exertional angina, although generally in the UK, bisoprolol is used as first line. In addition, beta blockers are the only anti-anginal drugs proven to prevent reinfarction and to improve survival in patients who have sustained a myocardial infarction. Other medications or less commonly used now include calcium channel blockers, for example, nicarandil, and they cause both uh, coronary and peripheral vasodilatation and reduce uh, contractility of the myocardium. Another treatment strategy includes uh, nitrates. So, for example, uh, GPs and cardiologists and other medics will often prescribe GTN spray or short-acting nitrate. NICE guidance says that you should offer a short-acting nitrate for preventing and treating episodes of angina and to use it immediately before any planned exercise or exertion. You should also inform the patient such as side effects as flushing, headache and lightheadedness may occur. And if you do feel lightheaded, you should encourage your patient to sit down or find something to hold on to. When a short acting nitrate is being used to treat episodes of angina, you should advise people to repeat the dose after five minutes if the pain has not gone, and to call an emergency ambulance if the pain has not gone five minutes after taking a second dose. In patients with exertional stable angina, chronic nitrate therapies such as uh, isosorbide mononitrate tablets or dermal preparations or GTN patches can improve exercise tolerance, the time to the onset of angina and ST segment depression uh, during exercise testing. However, the long term utility of nitrates can be limited by the induction of nitrate tolerance. And this is where patches rather than tablets can have a better utility. 
If the patient cannot tolerate beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, or both are contraindicated, then you should consider monotherapy with one of the following drugs. A long-acting nitrate, or evaporidine, or nicarandal, or ranolazine. Ranolazine is becoming an increasingly popular drug in the management of chronic coronary syndromes. It had approval from the FDA in 2006. It does have complex cellular mechanisms, but it basically prevents calcium overload and does also affect other cellular mechanisms. The starting dose is 500 milligrams BD or twice a day and is found to be far more effective than nicarandal in managing patient symptoms. As I said earlier, it's also important to reduce um, the risk of a acute coronary syndrome developing, so you want to think about drugs uh, for secondary prevention of uh, coronary events. And this includes consideration of aspirin, 75 milligrams once a day, the use of an ACE inhibitor in patients who have stable angina and diabetes, statin and plus minus azetimibe if there is poor lipid control, antihypertensives if necessary, and as a matter of routine, we should not be offering vitamin or fish oil supplements as there is no evidence of benefit. Sometimes patients who have significant or chronic angina, which is refractory to other medications, um, may be used um, for these other techniques such as TENS uh, or enhanced external counterpulsation. However, it is important to um, tell the patient that these interventions such as TENS uh, or EECP or acupuncture must not be used for stable angina and offered as a matter of routine. These sorts of therapies should only be initiated by a specialist uh, in chronic angina. Of course, like most medical problems, it's important that you discuss lifestyle interventions um, with the patient, so smoking cessation, a diet which is rich in vegetables and to reduce any alcohol intake, and to try and undertake 30 to 60 minutes of exercise most days. Of course, it's also important to monitor your weight. So this is just a brief overview of uh, chronic coronary syndromes. If you have any questions, of course, you are welcome to contact me and thank you for listening.